Welcome to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. Today, we're going to talk about steep climbs. We're also going to be talking about panic training. Uh, it, you know, it's the time of year when these big races happen, <laughs> and sometimes we find ourselves in a spot where we're not prepared for it. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about fitness plateaus and a lot more. We have Pivot Cycles and DT Swisses and Competitive Cyclists, Hannah Otto with us. Hannah, you're fresh back from Europe. We're going to talk all about that. Happy to have you with us. Uh, can we just actually jump right into that? Um you, so if anybody hasn't followed along, you can follow all of Hannah's goings on, on Instagram and Hannah, you went over and you raced the Nova Mesto world cup in the Czech Republic. You had a brief break and then Lenzer Haida and Leo gang world cups. So, uh, for those that don't know, you can watch those on GCM plus, um, if you're a cyclist and you don't have that subscription, this is not sponsored by them, but it's pretty nice to be able to have like all the racing in one spot right now. It's quite cool. And if you don't have uh, that, you should read Hannah's post-race reports and blogs. It feels like you're there. It's <laughs> awesome. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Do both. <laughs> yeah. Um, Hannah, you had further back starting positions than perhaps you've had in other years because, you know, you're not racing short track, which then decides the first few rows. Um, and you didn't have as many points because you've been focusing on other races leading into this. So you had further back starting positions. Uh, what have you learned I mean, you've, you've been racing for a long time, so I don't want to act like this is like a fresh thing for you. You've probably dealt with this a lot, but what are your learnings from having those further back starting positions? Yeah. Well, I think that's a great thing about cycling, right? Is that we're always learning. Um, so even though I've been doing it for a while, it's still like every single race is a chance to learn. And I think you're only cutting yourself short if you don't acknowledge that. So especially in the World Cups, I am always learning. Um, so just like Jonathan said, the start positions are determined based on UCI points, which you can take at any UCI race. So whether that's one in the States or at the actual World Cups. And one of the issues is with these UCI points, sometimes it very much feels like the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Because if you have a lot of UCI points, you're starting in the front of the grid, thereby giving you a better chance of getting more UCI points. And if you don't have as many UCI points, you're starting towards the back of the grid, which there were almost 100 women in these World Cups. So that means no. there's Oof. eight to a row. And so, you know, there's... <laughs> I was rows. starting, yeah, I You're was starting eighth back. row in many of these races, which means there's 50 something odd women in front of me and these courses are challenging. And so the odds of someone having an error or making a mistake in front of you is it, you're, the chances become exponentially higher with each person who has to overcome an obstacle. So for me, when I'm pre-riding the course, I'm for the first lap, I'm not even looking at the line I'd like to take. I'm trying to look at all of the obscure lines where I'm going to hopefully be able to get around these crashes, these mishaps. I'm looking at, you know, at the first lap, I'm not even going to have the chance at riding this. I'm going to have to run it. And I'm anticipating where am I already getting off my bike? And you have to think if the woman in the front is having a clean shot at it and she's riding it and I'm having to run it, I'm already bleeding time. And these races are mm. so competitive. You can't afford to make a mistake, much less give up free time in the first lap. So for me, starting further back, it completely changes the strategy of the race to start with. And you'll even hear some of the top women like Jenny Rizvids talk about she was 23rd call up in the short track in Lenzer Hyde. And she talked about how even 23rd call up changed her strategy for the race. Um, so one of the things you're looking at is how you're going to avoid crashes and sometimes you can, and sometimes you can't. Uh, so one of the things I do for trying to avoid crashes is you always want to have your eyes up. You want to be looking as far forward as possible, because if someone 10 people in front of you is crashing, there's a good chance that you have time to move out of the way. But if your eyes are down or fixated on the wheel in front of you, you're going to ride straight in to that crash. Um, another thing is, like I said, looking at unique lines, looking at maybe a line that actually is a little bit slower, but it's going to give you a chance to get around that crash. And then another thing is selecting a good start position. Um, and by that, again, if you're in the front row, you might take the inside line because you're going for the whole shot. But if I'm in the eighth row, I know I'm just going to get pinched. And so I'm maybe looking at going a lot wider, taking, again, an obscure line to try and get all the way around people. Um, and then of course being calm. And I think 
that is one of the hardest things in these races because you can't be too calm. You have to be quite aggressive. You have to hold on to your spot, but you have to be calm enough to not make mistakes, to not slam on brakes. Um, and then at the end of the day, sometimes you just can't avoid it. I mean, there was one race where it was a tight single track. A girl crashed right in front of me. She completely yard sailed everything. And it's a downhill. I don't want to run the downhill, but I I can't just levitate over her. So that just is what it is. And then you have to be flexible enough to know like, okay, this isn't the end of my race. I have to put this out of my head and work forward. How, when you're in those situations way far back, how different is the power profile in terms of what you're actually doing work through the pedals compared to if you were on the front of the field? Oh, I feel like in some ways this is almost a controversial question because I don't want to yeah. pretend like I'm putting out more power than the woman who's winning. That is not at all what I'm trying to say. But for me, when I am further back in a World Cup than when I'm winning, say, a U.S. Cup or something like that, the power profile is actually harder um, towards the rear because of the fact that, one, you have to start as hard as you can. Pacing, in some ways, unfortunately, becomes null and void because if you do try and pace it, you're going to get so clogged up in the single track that even when you're stronger than everyone else in the end because you've paced it well, you won't be able to pass. And so you have to go all out from the gun in order to secure a good spot. And then if you are at the front of the race, there's going to be times through the start finish, for example, that maybe everyone in the group sits up, looks around, plays some tactics, takes a gel. If you're chasing that is not an option. You are on the pedals the entire time because you're trying to make up as many places as you can. So there's a lot less power dips when you're chasing than when you're on the front and you're, you know, maybe taking turns, playing tactics, et cetera. I feel like you also have to be willing to sprint full gas at any point without mm -hmm. any like, cause I, I, I ideally, if you're just going out there and riding it individually as a time trial, you'd have power ceilings, right? And you would respect those power ceilings because you know that they could put you in, in deep energy debt that then would make it too difficult for you to maintain whatever average you would need to maintain after that. Yeah. But in this case, like you, you can't do that. You have to be willing to do 700 and above mm -hmm. with power output, even though you know that that's going to hurt your ability to be able to like finish the race as strong as you want but you have to do that because there's the chance that you could move up five spots. Or mm -hmm. if you don't do that, there's a very great likelihood that you will move back five spots. You may end up passing those people later on, but it costs you 30 seconds or a minute in the race because then you're stuck behind those people for a while more. It's like, exactly. it's kind of a, for me, it's like panic inducing because it's it like, is. Ugh, like I have to make bad choices that are going to harm my race. <laughs> But it's really like I'm making those just because I'm trying to avoid a lesser evil, you know? And, it's, I'll, it's and I'll add to that, that even as you're making that decision and you're knowing this is hurting me, this is not the best strategy, you also know that whomever you're catching up to <clears throat> is not extending that energy. Because in order for me to mm -hmm. sprint at the start from eighth row to fifth row, I am having to put out more power than everyone in that fifth row. And so I'm extending more mm -hmm. energy and I'm putting myself in deeper debt. And I know this the whole race, but you have to turn that voice off and do it anyways. It's really tough. It really, um, that's, I'm so amazed by some of the athletes that are able to move through the field so quickly. Like mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Nino, I think it was at, uh, was it at Lenzerheide or perhaps it was at late. Yeah, it was at Lenzerheide. Like, he didn't have an ideal call-up position because he was crashed out in short track. And I, so I think that he was like the very back of the short track field and he was third row and geez, like after 30 seconds in the race, he was in the front somehow. That's very different from coming from eighth row, <clears throat> right? Like that's totally different. But it's still very impressive. But it's still very impressive <laughs> that they're able to do that. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's a absolute skill to have for sure. I think <clears throat> Nino might also benefit from being Nino a bit, like in the sense that people, when they see him coming by, I don't know, maybe they actually kind of <clears throat> want to beat him more. 
so they you know block him or something but I bet the Red Sea kind of parts for uh, for Nino a little bit because it's I don't Nino. think anyone does <laughs> yeah. it intentionally, but there's probably something in the back of your mind because it's definitely true that when at least on the opposite, if someone is passing you that you know should not be passing you, something in your mind <laughs> kind of clicks. We're like, oh, I better go. Um, so I can imagine yeah. that if it's Nino, there's a little bit of like, mm, well, I mean, <laughs> going on. Yeah. He is the best ever to do it. So I guess, you know, it's okay. It doesn't hurt the yeah. pride when they pass, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. I, I want to talk about how the women's fields changed. I was just, when I was watching it, I was just, you know, doing some finger counting here and naming off the names that I thought could win. And I got over 15 names and I just stopped counting. Like 15 athletes that I think on the women's side can genuinely, like, I don't know who could win. And if you had those 15 names, I feel like it's almost an equal chance that any of them can win before a race. It feels like the women's field is like at an all time high for depth. Is that, have you noticed that being on the ground in those races? Definitely. And I've spoken with multiple women across the field and everyone's agreeing, even looking at power numbers, you know, putting out the same or greater power and seeing maybe not the same finish position that you would expect from that power. I think this is without a doubt the mm. highest level we have ever seen at the World Cups, um, especially for the women's field. And, you know, when it's that competitive, there is little to no room for error. And every mm -hmm. single advantage you have is really exposed. Um, so everything from equipment choice to, like we're talking about, call-up positions, you know, it's like, I feel like when there was a greater difference between riders, you could work your way up through the field. But now that there's very small difference, that disadvantage of being further back is super exposed. Um, and same thing with, like I said, line choices, equipment choices, all of that. I think that that is something that is really, really remarkable about World Cup racing that I wish somehow we could show the general public because the amount of thought that goes into these courses and the inches in which we're looking at these courses of, I want to put my tire here, not here, because this is one second faster per lap. It is amazing. And it can also make you go a little crazy uh, trying to be that yeah, exact. And so sure. I think it just takes such a unique athlete in order to be able to be that detailed, but also not be stressed ab about being that detailed. Mm. Um, and that's something that I think is super impressive. And I also think that with all of this, the starts are a lot harder. Um, I feel mm -hmm. like we used to have a slightly more paced start. Now it's pretty much full gas from the line, which means there's a lot more panic throughout the whole field, which means we're seeing a lot more crashes. Uh, we're seeing people be mm -hmm. more aggressive and not necessarily in a way that's productive and elevating the level of play more in a way of desperation, which is creating more sure. chaos and more crashes. Um, and then again, a little bit of a controversial point, but I, I actually think in some ways it's important to look at is I think we're seeing a greater level of disappointment across the field. And I think that's because when 15 women can win, only one does. And so 14 women are left frustrated. And then there's, say, 40 women who all think they can be in the top 20. Only 20 can. So 20 women are disappointed. And it goes all the way down the field. And you see a lot of people finishing the races feeling a sense of disappointment. And I think it's important to remember that disappointment is okay, but you don't have to be disappointed in order to seek greater results. Um, it's not, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are afraid to say, you know, hey, I had a good race, but I didn't have the result I wanted because it's almost showing complacency. And I don't think those things are the same. You can want something and strive for something and still not, uh, you know, be totally devastated when you don't reach it. And I think that's something that's super important in these races as well is two race world cups, no matter who you are. I mean, even the last place woman is one of the best racers in the world. Um, and it takes a tremendous amount of resiliency to line up on that start line week after week after week, because we see, I mean, 
Chris Blevins, I think, is a great example. He's been world champion. He is a phenomenal racer. There is zero question in anyone's mind. He was, I think, 10th in Lenzerheide and then somewhere in the 50s in Leo Gang. It's just, mm -hmm. that's how high the level is, is you can, you fluctuate throughout the field. It's not a matter of if you'll fluctuate, it's you are going to, and you have to be able to stay level headed enough to not fall into the trap of you're only as good as your last race. And oh my gosh, I'm on the back foot. Now I need to panic train. Now I need to change everything I've ever done. No, reset and show up to the next weekend and do better. Yeah, we've even seen that with Pauline and Nino, many time world champions, you know, uh, and they they're having you know wildly fluctuating results too. I kind of <clears throat> I want to jump down on the notes of the points that I wanted to cover to the point of how much of this do you think is just like expectations need to be recalibrated for athletes, or perhaps better said, what do you do when expectations don't match outcome? Because for you, like you've mentioned. Uh, if you go on Instagram, you can see that, you know, you've these less than ideal start positions have made things tough and mm -hmm. you want to be battling in the top 20 in the top 10, mm -hmm. like that's where you want to be, but mm -hmm. you aren't getting there right now. Yeah. And I fully so how, believe I have do? that ability. How do you yeah, that? exactly. Yeah. It's like, you have to stay true to the fact that you believe in your ability. And I think a lot of people you know, the reasons you're not there are not excuses because it's a part of the race. And I recognize that. I'm not saying, oh, well, if blah, 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 then I'd be in the top 20. Like, well, those things are a part of the race. So you weren't. But that doesn't mean that I'm not strong enough. It doesn't mean that I'm not training hard enough. It just means I need to keep working and I need to keep showing up. And so I think two things. First, the way I evaluate a race is I write down everything that I did well. I write down everything that I can learn from and then I forget everything else because everything else is just pointless. Um, you don't want to ignore the things you did wrong because you can learn from them. So like I said, if you can learn from it, great. Otherwise, forget about it. Um, and then when you line up for your next race, you have to remember that nothing, nothing has changed. So for example, when I line up for the race and I'm thinking, I can be top 20. And then I cross the finish line, not in the top 20. I'm not a different athlete than the person who stood on the line believing that. I can still cross the finish line, not in the top 20, and firmly believe that on a different day, in different circumstances, I can do it. Um, and I think it's really important to continue that self-belief. And I think one of the ways you can continue that self-belief is by not just focusing on outcome goals that I think is massive in these World Cups because you don't have, especially when you're starting in further back rows, you don't have control over who crashes. You don't have control over so many things that that number on the piece of paper at the end very, very likely will not show the whole story. And so you have to have something you can grasp onto at the end and say, you know what, but I did this well. And that might be power numbers. It might be a goal for your start. Um, it might be lines you're taking. It might be your nutrition throughout. You have to have something where you can finish and say, I had a good race. The result just didn't show it. Um, and I think you also have to be able to hold your head high. And not everyone's going to understand that. Not everyone's going to see that. But it doesn't matter. Like You just have to keep showing up and being confident because it'll pay off. Yeah. If you let the belief part fall away, then you don't have anything to go on. Like there's, the, it's, uh, yes. If you, if your belief is like not justified, like, cause sometimes like, yeah. you know, sometimes that could happen. Somebody could be like, I believe that I am world champion and they could be, you know, far, far, far from being able to achieve that. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. But you know, assuming that they are realistic, if you lose your belief, there's just simply no reason to go try. Like exactly. the, there, there is no reason. And, and that's, if you let a day with so many things that can influence outcomes, define your beliefs, then you get into a situation where you're just going to fulfill that prophecy once again. And it's just going to be you back in that spot. And then you'll even feel like kind of upset about that. You'll be like, yeah, here I am exactly where originally I thought I shouldn't be, but it turns out this is exactly where I should be. There's this whole spiraling uh, dynamic that happens with this managing belief and expectations and outcomes. 
But I really like your point that you have to hold on to the belief and know where you can be. And you just have to understand what influenced that outcome. And like you said, learn from what you did well, learn from what you could improve and remove the rest. Wise, mm -hmm. wise words, Hannah. Um, can I talk about Leo gang really quick? Those climbs were so steep. How much power did it take just to get up the climbs? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I'm talking not fall over. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Gosh, they were so steep. Uh, I actually... <laughs> I, I ran a 30 tooth chain ring, which is something I pretty much never do. That's Whoa. such a small chain ring. Um, yeah. So they were so <laughs> steep and it was just, everything was straight up or straight down. So there wasn't even really a place where it's like, oh, I'll be spun out here. It was like, you're either climbing up this thing or you're not pedaling at all as you're going down a chute. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was an interesting thing in pre-ride because exactly like you're saying, there was a minimum amount of power to get up these climbs. And <laughs> I think, you know, for, for some of the pitches, um, I think it was around 300 Watts for me. I mean, that wasn't Just sustained across the whole upright. line. Yeah, exactly. Like some of the steep pitches at the top, it's like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, <laughs> trying to get up them. So yeah, I mean, for the sustained climb, you're looking at probably like 250 to get up. And then for some of those pitches, maybe around 300. <laughs> And Hannah, do you mind sharing like your weight so then people can kind of put that in, in context uh, for what yeah, it might be for uh, them? Uh, I am, I'm, I'm 119. So I think that's 54 or 55 kilos. Yeah, I think so. Google I'm it. doing some quick math really quick. <laughs> Look at us. 54. <laughs> yep. Perfect. <laughs> <clears throat> well done, Hannah. So that's like, uh, that's hard. And that's in the 30 tooth you were doing. That. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. if you had a 32 or a 34, you'd be putting out even more power just to stay upright, you know? Yeah. Like, that was, cow. I pre-rode the first day on the 32 and I was like, you know what? In the last lap, this is going to be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Smart choice. I'm, I'm bringing to single track six, uh, that Ivy and I are doing in a few weeks now I'm bringing a 32, 34. And then I, cause I typically run like a 36. Um, and then mm. when I'm training on the road and stuff, I run a 38, but I'm going to bring a 32 and a 34 and heck I might even bring a 30. I remember last mm -hmm. time there I was particularly blown and I think I'm a better athlete now and more resilient, but I remember having a 30. And I was dying with a 30 on one of the climbs that they had different course. Hopefully they don't have a climb like that again. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> what yeah. did you, for yeah, context, tough. what did you run at Leadville? Uh, at Leadville, this is a funny point. Everyone, I think I ran a 30, a 30 at Leadville okay. because of power line. And that's yeah. like a thing where everyone was like, you'll spin out. But the reality is, I wasn't spinning out. I had a 10, mm -hmm. like I used mm -hmm. the 10 a fair amount in some of like on coming back on pipeline. Mm -hmm. But when I was coming down Columbine, I wasn't pedaling. I was tucking and trying to save energy. Like that was yeah. all I was doing there. And then if I was coming down sugar loaf or something like that, or pipeline or sorry, power line, definitely not pedaling there. So in all of those situations, I didn't spin out. And I know a lot of people like really criticize that afterward. They're like, that's way too small. But those are if from people that are having to walk it, power line. Yeah. If you do the math you know? on it, though, I don't have it in front of me, but I think you'd be have, have to be going like 25 miles per hour at like 100 RPMs to spin out a 30 ton. So don't yeah. quote me on that. I don't know the and exact the flats, numbers, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. Somebody is going over to Sheldon Brown's gear calculator, a exactly. really old website that's <laughs> on the internet and checking this out right now. Um, but it's, it's in most cases, it's everybody overestimates, like they think that they can get away with a bigger chain ring size and, or I should, I should say that like, they think that a better, a bigger chain ring size would be better. Um, ideally like you want to optimize it's, for the straightest chain line, you know, it's and only better for your ego. That's it. <laughs> that's exactly it. <laughs> <laughs> and in most cases, like the, the, if in a race in an XCO race, a 34 for me, somewhere around there, a 36, it might be okay. But in many cases I dropped down to a 32 and I'm willing to drop down to a 32 or a 30 mm -hmm. as well. So it's, yep. yeah. Chain rings before ego. Um, I, how'd you pace those climbs though? Because they're so hard. You kind of know that it's going to be like you said, at last lap, that sort of thing. Like once you're fatigued, 
it's kind of just like you're at your maximum speed, I assume. Like you're mm -hmm. kind of tapped out just to get up the thing, right? Yeah. So I have to give the disclaimer that I actually did not finish Leo Gang. Um, and that was for the reason that I actually went into anaphylactic shock. So I have some very severe mm -hmm. allergies to nuts and peanuts um, that are anaphylactic. And somehow, some way, I was exposed. So about a lap in, I, my throat started closing up. Um, and I couldn't breathe and it became a medical situation. So I had to pull out, um, which was very scary and very, very sad. But I still had a race plan. So we can still talk about pacing, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which is, you know, the longest climb out there was about four and a half minutes long. So, you know, if you just did the math on that, you would think, you know, you could do 120% at threshold or something on that. But the reality mm -hmm. is you then only have 30 seconds to recover on the next downhill and then you're doing another four minute climb. And so that actually becomes in some ways a very aerobic effort because you're not fully recovering. And so you think you can hold that high of power. So when you look down, you're shocked, but over time, you're actually doing more of a threshold effort across the course. So I think if you were to do a time trial, that would actually be ideal is like sitting at threshold or just above threshold, but you're not doing a time trial. And especially like we already talked out, if you're starting further back, you're just going to have to burn matches. Um, but I think honestly, as in the mountain bike, even if you're in the front, you're able to pace it a little bit better, but you're still competing for the single track, you're still, you know, trying to get the best lines. And so, like you said, I think, you know, come mid to end of the race, you really are just maxed out. It's the best you can do to get up. Plus, like I said, for most, you know, for most, if the, if you have to put out 300 Watts to get up some of those, you're not able to maintain you know, for most of the women, that probably isn't their threshold out there. And so you're having to spike over anyways, which means you're going to have to find recovery somewhere else as well. Yeah. So this brings up a point that's always like irked me with cycling commentators and they're like, oh, he's gone anaerobic when people blow up. And I'm like, no, they're actually more aerobic now than they <laughs> yes, were exactly. <laughs> because there are no anaerobic stores left. They're gone, yes. you know, like, <clears throat> yeah. Basically, he's left on pump gas. That's what's really happened. Race gas is yeah. all gone. So yeah. um, I, I want to go into uh, Nathan's question, then back up to Dan's question, looking in our doc here. So uh, Nathan's question says, in a much earlier episode, there was a theoretical question about racing cyclocross on mountain bike tires, and everyone, Jonathan included, said it sounded miserable and they wouldn't want to do it. However, in a few episodes recently, Jonathan has been very much in the biggest fast tire camp and has been talking about doing some testing to prove it. UCI tire rules aside, do the hosts still think that cyclocross on mountain bike is a bridge too far on the wider is faster motto or have opinions on this changed? When is wider slower? As someone who races cyclocross on their mountain bike, I'd love to put my quote 32 isn't faster and is just tradition theory validated, but I value all the input. Ivy, what do you think uh, on this one? Like it was, was the I, one that races cross and does, does all this stuff. Was I on that episode? This yeah, is I yes, I believe so. This is why you can't gaslight me because I do not remember anything that has happened or what I have said. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe whatever he said. <laughs> um, but yeah, if I said that, maybe I'm, I'm changing my mind about it. Um, I think it's just yeah. more the idea of being on a bike that would accommodate mountain bike tires in a cross race race that would bum me out. Yes. You know, I think that was probably my more significant sentiment than just like having big tires. Like if I could have a cross bike that was UCI legal with that would accommodate like 2.0s, but had the same geo as a cross bike and felt like it, like, yeah, that'd be sick. But, um, and you could shoulder it and it was light yeah. and it has all those <laughs> other, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so I think yeah. I was thinking about, you know, if you were to have mountain bike tires, what all the things that would come along with that, that would make me bummed out. Um, However, there might be some courses or cycle cross scenarios where having like a smaller XC tire would be really, really nice. Um, like really rudy mm. technical ones or um mud. Mud. Yeah. Yeah. So you want something skinnier usually with mud. It depends on the mud, I guess, probably, right, Ivy? Like in some cases, mud mud yeah. mud isn't just one type of mud. It's probably 
quite different, but. Right. And like the same with, you know, cross tread and mountain bike tread, like they're not all the same in the mud. Like some treads really pick up a lot of mud and then it doesn't matter if it's better to be skinny or uh, fat in your tire tread. Like if it's the wrong tread and it's picking up all the mud, like you're kind of screwed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's no, like, I think the whole point of cross is you're hilariously under equipped and under biked all the time. And so like, there's never, it seems like there's never like a perfect recipe or a perfect tire. So I don't know. I'll take my answer back and be open to XC tires on the cross course. (laughs) Yeah. I, I want to defend like the miserable side of things. It would be miserable to shoulder my bike and have like, you know, a Fox float shock on my collarbone instead of, you know, a frame that's designed to be carried. That Mm -hmm. would be miserable. I'd be miserable to have a bike that's heavier than it should be, or to be running like minion DHFs on a cross course, <laughs> like yeah. that would, or like forecasters, you know, like <laughs> that would be miserable. Uh, having tires that are wider, larger volume would not be miserable. It would be faster and it would be better. But then like Ivy, you kind of said like, it's intentionally constrained. That's like what cyclocross is about is like, and I know that's why a lot of people considered like when we put like dropper posts on cyclocross bikes a handful of years ago and I like in wide range, wide range, one by gearing, mm-hmm. I, like listen back to the podcast back from like 2015 and 2016, when I was saying that I was going to do this stuff, people were outraged and angry <laughs> and like coming up to us at races and being like, you're ruining cyclocross. Oh, like, because and now everyone's Dare on one by drive the trains of and dropper posts will become... <laughs> <laughs> the spirit of cyclocross. Yes. We stabbed a garlic laden steak through its heart. So oh my like, gosh. and I just, uh, everyone's on one by drive trains with wide range gearing now. I mean, most people, sh- everyone should be, uh, if they're not. And then on top of that, then dropper posts are going to become even more common in cyclocross. It's absolutely going to happen. They're just getting lighter and they're getting easier. So it, it'll, it'll be there, but okay. So all that aside, I do think that it would be faster, it would be more comfortable, and it would be better handling if you could fit 2.0, 2.2s, heck, even 2.4s. Like I'm I'm not fully convinced that 2.4s are really slow compared to 2.2s. It's just dependent on the course and the conditions. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if you're dealing with like a course that's really bumpy, constantly bumpy, that's when a big volume tire really helps. And especially if you can run something like inserts in there, because then it basically makes it so that it's like a, a more progressive air spring rate for your suspension, meaning that you can have a lot of initial suppleness to soak up all of those little bumps in the grass and like that hard pat clay that's kind of like formed into constantly having these bumps and deformations. And if you run a bigger tire, it can soak all of that little chatter up and allow your it's all about momentum, right? Like you have forward momentum and anytime you hit a bump and some of that forward momentum is transferred into upper momentum, you're losing speed. So if you can have tires that allow preservation of, of forward momentum, then boom, like you are going to be faster. But then at that point, isn't it just mountain biking? Like, I think that's why the restrictions in place, at least it seems that way to me, Ivy. Yeah. I mean, that's, that must be why the UCI still demands little tiny tires when, all of our cross bikes can accommodate, you know, forties, forty twos, and bigger. <laughs> like, yeah. I guess it's just they want us to be under bike, which is fine because it's funny to see us fall down and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how funny! Yeah. yeah <laughs> oh, how cute! Yeah. <laughs> They're doing their best. Isn't that cute? <laughs> Hannah, what do you think about this? Because you 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 race cross as well, and you have, <laughs> you have experience in that realm. Yeah, I think it's totally course dependent. Like I, I, I love this question because it's so fun to have these kind of debates. Um, but I'm just picturing a bunch of people at the side of a cyclocross course, and everyone wants to have that belief that they have the best setup, and so everyone's arguing, you know, just so headstrong that their setup is the best for the for everything across the board, but it's, it's totally course dependent. And that's why professionals have so many different types of equipment. Um, I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, let's say a cross course is like basically a road, like there are some cross courses that are just pristine. Um, I mean, if a 40 C tire was faster across the board, even on roads, then we'd be running them in the tour. Like there is a point Mm -hmm. in which skinnier is faster. Um, 
but that's not all the time because like Jonathan said, things come into play like the bumps, like the mud, you know, there's all kinds of things. Plus it's not just about the width of the tire. It's about the tread pattern. So, you know, maybe a wider tire would be faster, but you have such an aggressive tread pattern on it that it's just so slow rolling. So there's a lot of different things to consider in this question. And so I think yeah. what you can hold on to is there will be uh, some courses in which, you know, your setup is the best. And maybe you even seek out those courses and you feel like you've figured out the secret to racing those courses. Mm -hmm. But there, unfortunately, will also be some times where, you know, tradition kind of, it, it holds true. Yeah, for sure. There's, and I think that the reason that wider tires are not faster, there's two like main governing things or really like three. Number one, it's aerodynamics. Like on road bikes, it's pretty impressive to see to the lengths at which like, like absolutely keep this in mind when they design a road frame, they're designing it with a specific tire and rim profile in mind. And then the frame is built around that as well. So you know, if they, if you just throw on a huge wide tire and it doesn't match your rim, you've gotten rid of all the aerodynamic benefits of your rim and tire. And as a result, now you have a lot of drag and you've probably even negated a lot of the aerodynamic effect of your frame. So that's already there. But then in addition to that, as outside of aerodynamics, you have the issue of a larger contact patch, which means there's more friction on the ground, right? But the hope is that since it's a wider tire, perhaps it has to deform slightly less and then there's less tension in the casing and that's friction there in the casing. But the biggest limiting factor is the fact that a wider tire uses a lot more material and it will be heavier. And if we had some sort of big step change in tire technology that allowed us to get 2.6s, like crazy wide, like, you know, plus bike size, size tires, but also to get them to be the weight of what we currently have. I bet that you could design frames, chassis and everything else around that differently. And it would allow greater speed, but we are definitely limited. And what they do with tires already is, is really impressive to get the weight down on some of these tires and still keep puncture protection, make it so the tire doesn't want to fold underneath you all the time. It's it's really interesting, but, um, the benefits of wider really in for cyclocross purposes and mountain bike, it's to absorb all those little bumps that would disrupt things. Um, and I don't think that pros are always necessarily on the forefront of things. There's a lot of tradition that drives stuff, but there are certain exceptions to that. And there's very data driven folks, um, in that world. And I, I think of like Nino's team in particular, who ran the traditional tubulars for a really long time and they switched to tubeless tires, but to 2.4s. And I don't think that they just randomly decided to like double the width of their tires more than double it. And then just like, yeah, this might work out. There's a lot of testing that went on there, um, to decide that that works on the mountain bike side. So yeah, my, my hunch is that wider would be faster, but that's not the spirit of cyclocross here. I am <laughs> defending it. So, <laughs> you know, gotta, gotta be underbiked. Okay. Dan's question. I have three Leadville related questions for Hannah Otto next time she's on. Number one, and uh, I'll read through all the questions and then we'll go back to number one. Sound good, Hannah? Um, so uh, number one, how are you approaching Leadville from a mental perspective after winning it last year? Number two, what changes will you make to your strategy like crewing, equipment, nu nutrition, et cetera? And number three, do you find it useful for Leadville to do intervals at very high, high elevations beforehand? So returning back to number one, uh, how are you approaching Leadville from a mental perspe perspective after winning it last year? Is there added pressure? How are you managing it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think there easily could be added pressure. You could definitely go into it with sort of a monkey on your back. But for me, I think it actually takes some of the pressure away. And we'll see if I still feel that way standing on the start line. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I really feel like the only thing harder than winning once is winning twice in a row. That's kind of how I feel. Um, and so I know it's going to be very challenging. I know it's a huge ask, but I also know that I've already proven to myself that I can do it. And so I get to take 
in my opinion, that stress away of wondering if I can and replace it with knowing that I can and just focusing on the execution. Um, and so for me, that gives me a lot of confidence going into it that I already know what it's like to win that race. And I have that advantage. And then also remembering that a huge key to my success last year was racing without expectation. And so I would be so foolish to not take that learning lesson into this mm -hmm. year again. And so that is probably my number one focus actually going into Leadville is not expecting anything. And that means not expecting to win, which is different than not wanting to win. You better believe I'm showing up with the intention of winning, <laughs> but <laughs> expecting it is something very different. Yeah, that's a great example of what you just said earlier, Hannah, about writing down the things you did well and then making sure that you do those things again. Like, for example, going in without expectations. What changes are you going to make to your strategy uh, from the crewing, nutrition, equipment side, or anything else? Could even be yeah. like logistics in terms of where you're staying or anything else. Yeah, uh, this is such an interesting... I've asked myself this a lot because on one hand, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like what I did last year worked and it worked really well. So a piece of me is like so hesitant to make any changes, but you know, a driving principle in sport is to always improve and to always seek that improvement. So I also wouldn't be true to myself if I didn't chase after that improvement. You know, I'm not just trying to do what I did last year. I'm trying to do it better. Um, and so for me, that does mean taking calculated risks to do things better. And I think that's one of the joys of having already figured out, quote unquote, a formula to win is I think when you haven't one, you're kind of reeling in a race of, well, what does it take to win? And you might be looking at some of the bigger picture things, but since I feel, I feel like I have some of those bi bigger picture things nailed down, I now have the capacity to focus on those marginal gains. And so, um, for me, one of the things is I'm going to be taking in more of my carbs through drink mix. That was something that I didn't feel like I had the time to get my stomach to adjust to last year. And now I feel like, you know, I really like the first endurance mix that I'm using. I'm really comfortable with it. I've already been practicing with it for months and I feel really good on it. And so I'll be taking in more carbs through my drink mix and more carbs per hour in general. Last year I had worked up nice. to only about 80 and I'd really love to push that to at least a hundred this year. Um, another nice. thing is last year, given my race schedule, I hadn't done more than a three hour ride in five weeks leading up to Leadville. And so I actually wow. showed up to Leadville, <laughs> hence the no expectations, feeling very <laughs> underprepared for that type of effort. Um, and that's one of those things where it's like, okay, clearly that worked out well, but we know that that's not the most optimal preparation. And so I'm not just going to blind, blindly follow that because it worked out well. You know, that's one of those things of, I see it more as, wow, I did that with that type of preparation, what can I do if? And so I'll be following a more, a more standard type of preparation leading into the race. And then I'm also playing with some other much smaller type of marginal gains. Um, and an example of that would be just looking a little bit more at some arrow options. Uh, so something as small as last year, I wore my hair in a braid. Um, and we've learned that that's actually pretty slow. So I'll have my hair in a bun this year, uh, just because I think every watt just cut counts. it off. And so you I'm, shave it yeah, off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. You can pull and it so off. Just, You'd look great. Yeah. Do it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just playing with some of those things too, uh, getting a little nerdy, which is fun. Hannah, it's interesting that you mentioned the like fact that you came in with like only doing three hour rides and everything else. Maybe there's something to this because we have so many athletes that are time constrained and they're like, Hey, I I can't do these big ones. And they put in great results. Like Nate is a good example mm -hmm. of this. Um, even prior to level for me, I think that the longest ride I did was a four hour ride. Um, and, uh, I, I didn't set the light, I didn't light the world on fire or something, but like, you know, like it's, uh, maybe there's a difference too, between like what you're trying to do, which is win. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. for people that are trying to like, you know, trying to finish or PR or something like that, like, you know, 
at the pointy end is kind of a different deal. But it's totally. Uh, I don't yeah, want to make exciting, it sound like you. Stuff. Yeah, I don't want to make it sound like you can't do Leadville on three hour rides because you absolutely can, and that is a proven fact. It's more like you're saying of if you're trying to reach your. Uh, I guess, spoiler alert for another mm-hmm. question, genetic potential, then you're probably going to want to yeah. push mm-hmm. into some of those higher rides. For sure. You know, it's, it was kind of interesting too with this is over time, what I've learned is that the reason, cause I've always wondered why we see a lot of athletes that do like really long rides before their big event, that sort of thing. Cause they're prepping for their big event, you know, and it logically makes sense. It's like, if I'm going to do something that's five hours long, I should be able to do five hours beforehand. But oftentimes you see those like athletes doing that approach. It doesn't pan out that well for them on race day. And over the years now of being exposed to so many different athletes training, right. At like a huge scale. I think that my belief is, is solidified that the reason that that's the case is because average people don't recover well from training. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because they're genetically different, although that might be at play, but it's really just because they are logistically constrained in their Mm -hmm. lives. And when they go out and do a five hour ride, it's a lot more difficult to recover for most Mm -hmm. of them, uh, because they aren't going to go easy for the subsequent days after that. And as a result, they'll just carry that fatigue and they won't get the benefit they need from the training. So yeah, it's kind of an interesting, um, uh, I I love to like look at this like over like a really long time scale, but it's really hard to filter out all the data and understand everything and do it so responsibly. But yeah, quite mm-hmm. interesting. Okay, uh, do you find it useful to do? Because this is a debate. <clears throat> You'll see different with elevation training, which go to our YouTube channel. We've had a lot of different videos on uh, uh, elevation training. Subscribe to our Instagram where you can see Ivy and Sarah producing awesome videos about topics like this. There's a lot of different approaches on what to do with elevation depending on what your goal is. Sometimes you'll do like a high elevation camp and you'll only be riding really low intensity up at elevation. In some cases, uh, it's more common to see, go to an elevation, go do high elevation, do sprint intensity training where you're just doing like really short one minute bouts. And then you give yourself plenty of time to recover in between. And you're just doing that. Then there are some people that view that like, well, at Leadville, I'm going to be climbing at like tempo on these really long climbs. So I need to go do long tempo intervals, get into sweet spot up at elevation. There's a lot of different approaches. Do you, you already live around 5,000 feet, I would assume in Mm -hmm. terms of where you're, you, your base at, and you just go up from there. Do you do, do you try to go up to the very top of guardsman pass there in Utah and do really hard intervals? Or what do you do to prep for this? That's not a focus of mine. No. Um, I, I do think that for Leadville, it's helpful that I live around 5,000 feet because I, I personally feel like that gives me a small little base, if nothing else of confidence. Um, it's not, it's still shocking. 5,000 feet is much different than 10,000 feet, but it's not (laughs) as different as zero to 10,000. So I think that for me living at that 5,000 feet, is helpful. Um, I don't, I I think it's helpful because it's not a lot higher. So Mm -hmm. if you go too much higher, there's just so many things that become an issue. Um, so many things that I can't even begin to go into it, but I'll, I'll just say two things on this, um, is one, if you want to do some intervals at really high elevation, I think it can be beneficial mentally. But you have to understand that I think that's pretty much it. Um, especially if you're not living up there, you're not gaining any adaptations, um, you're not getting used to it. You're simply doing the intervals to know, hey, this is how it feels to go this hard. And if you have a pace in mind for Leadville, which you should for that dis- duration of a race, then you need to know what it's going to feel like. And so I do think it has a place and it can be helpful and it can help you mentally prepare because it is uncomfortable and it's going to be uncomfortable for eight, nine, 10, 12, et cetera hours. Um, and that's okay. But one of the big issues with people wanting to go that high and trying to go that high because a lot of people do, they'll go to Leadville two, three weeks in advance. And some people are very successful with that. So It's not to say that you can't, but for me, the reason I don't is because in my opinion, I can't recover when I'm that high. So that means I can't train well enough. 
uh, because I can't recover well enough. And so I feel like not only am I not recovering, but I'm not training. And so I feel that for me, it's kind of a double whammy in terms of feeling like I'm going into the race underprepared and underrested. And that's the reason that I don't do it for me personally. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Spot on Hannah. Um, I'm excited to, I, I won't be at Leadville this year. Uh, that's right around my daughter's birthday and it's going to be her first birthday. Very exciting. Time. Oh, so super exciting, which for what it's worth, I think that we should just celebrate my wife instead of my daughter. My daughter doesn't even know what's going on. She's just happy <laughs> yeah. all the time, but my wife is the real one that's carried the burden here. <laughs> Let's be real. So, um, but anyways, uh, Michael's question. Sorry for the, the tangent there. Michael says, just finished my A event, the Merit Crown, and have Trainer Road to thank for being able to complete it. Everything from pacing to my 100 grams per hour for fuel was all from the podcast. Love the knowledge and experiences y'all share. Thank you. This reminds me of a point that I didn't make. You made a really good point, Hannah, and I, I wanted to mention something on it, but I didn't to not interrupt. You taking in more of your carbohydrates through drink mix means that you are also going to be taking in more hydration, more likely to be taking in more hydration, which is super important up at elevation. So this is like really super smart move uh, to do that. So another great point that Hannah's doing. I know typically people are like, oh, a long day, you want to take in some solids, but solids take more liquid to break down as well. It's tougher for your body to break it down. I think that there's a lot to be said for drink mix. So uh, smart thinking. Okay. Michael says, <clears throat> I was really excited to use AI FTP to see my new FTP number following the specialty phase of the plan. As I felt like I've been fairly compliant, feel free to check the receipts. <laughs> However, I felt a bit gutted to only get a one watt increase. I'm now worried that I'm about to put in more work and just plateau. I want to get faster, but I'm honestly weighing how much I want to give up early bedtimes, trainer rides in the summer, missing group rides, eating clean, etc. for what could be a watt when is all, when all is said and done. I know at some point the growth has to slow down and you need to do more to get less. However, I feel like I'm too early to be reaching this phase. I know I still have some low hanging fruit, like getting even more sleep, eating cleaner and adding strength training, which I plan to do to address in the upcoming blocks. So my question, what are the signs that you have nearly reached your potential as an athlete? I know I still have lots of lots left until I reach that point. However, this one watt increase really got me thinking at what point would I give up the one watt increase to be able to say yes, to do junk miles with the homies, any insight in general, or me specifically based on my data would be amazing. Love everything you do five stars for everything. So the root of this question, what are the signs that you've nearly reached your potential as an athlete? We'll get to that, but you, um, invited us to take a look at your career and we always learn from these audits, so to speak from checking the receipts, as Michael said, uh, Ivy, what do you, so let's just go into some basic observations of looking at Michael's training in terms of what they've been doing. Yeah. Um, and now reading this question again, I think I have a lot to say about, uh, what Michael thinks about what they're weighing and giving up in order to be a good athlete that, um, I want to address for sure. Um, mm -hmm. but in terms of their training, I mean, the first red flag that I see is expecting a big watt increase in your FTP after your specialty phase, um, your specialty phase. And really, if, even if you're not a trainer at athlete and, you know, doing something else and you're having a period of time before a race, um, that's not meant to be your time where you make a bunch of big gains and you shouldn't expect to finish this phase where you're really, we use this phrase all the time, like sharpening the knife and really refining the work that you've already done. That's not the time where you expect to see a huge increase in your FTP. This is the time to settle into the fitness that you've created and really do the final touches of preparing for an event, not do all this big digging and building that will ultimately fatigue you further. Um, so that's okay. the first misconception is that you should expect to see a big FTP increase after your specialty phase. That's not what you should expect. And it doesn't mean that you've reached your potential because you didn't see an increase after your specialty phase. Um, what else is there? Rest weeks. Yeah. And John, do you want to talk about rest weeks? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, uh, and, and this is so key what you said, Ivy. And if you look back at their, they saw a significant improvement in FTP all along this season. So I'm just going to like, I'm looking right now at like their FTP history, um, just to back up what you're saying here, Ivy, we go from 270 Watts to 279 to 293 in May of this year. So like huge improvements. 
and then uh, now at this point, there's like a manual adjustment to 299 um, and upping it from there that you've recently done just uh, in the past, you know, past few days. So there was a huge improvement in the base to build phase, which is where we typically see these FTP improvements, right, Hannah? Like that's, that's where you see it. It's not in the specialty phase. Absolutely. Yeah. So now looking at this though, Ivy, you bring up the, the recovery week thing. And I think that average athletes think pros are really good at training and they are, but they're really good at recovering. And mm -hmm. this is what makes and the best amateur athletes that I see as well. The reason that they are faster than other people is because they understand the relationship that I need to dose my body with stress and then I need to allow it time to absorb. And if you don't do that, you're just like putting water on an already saturated sponge. It's not going anywhere beside falling off the sponge. You need to allow that sponge time to dry out so then it can become saturated once again. Um, the only I'm difference so glad in this you case said is that. the sponge... Because I was thinking so, of yeah. an analogy to try to describe why you shouldn't do this. And I was like, you know, just drowning your plants with water all the time. But I don't think everyone is a plant person. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the, that's actually a better analogy because there's growth going on, right? Like if you just continually flood your plants with water, they don't grow. In fact, they start to wilt and it starts to damage them. Uh, white leaves, bad things. So like in this case, if you are trying to get faster, if you're trying to grow that plant, you give it the correct amount of water. And that varies per plant, just like it varies per person. I should not be doing what Hannah does, and I should not be doing what Ivy does. We should all be doing what we need, giving ourselves the appropriate amount of water and giving our, our soil and our roots time to be able to process that before we start doing it again, because that's how growth happens. Mm -hmm. And in this case, what I'm seeing in Michael's uh, career, and this is so common, and this is personally, I make this mistake a ton too. So. I just want to make sure that like, I'm not in some sort of ivory tower here. We all make this mistake and it's extremely tempting to make this mistake. But in this case, it's more like egregious. I would say on Michael's side is in most cases, if you look at recovery week, sometimes they're just skipped altogether and it's just continued stress. But in most cases, what you're seeing is you're seeing a recovery week prescribes this amount of hours or this amount of TSS. And it's very commonly you're putting in double that. So basically what you're doing is you're taking this time of, let's say that you need to water your plant every one time every week. And you're saying, nope, I'm going to water it two times a week and it's still going to get faster, but the plant doesn't, it, it can't just adapt to that. It doesn't work. Like it needs, it's, it needs what it needs on the schedule that it needs. Just like you in your life, you have to keep that in mind. And that's what those rest weeks are for. They allow you to absorb it. And without it, you're just not going to get faster. And instead you'll plateau like you're fearing in this case, but instead it's not just coming from you checking all the boxes and doing the right things and reaching genetic potential. Instead, to me, it looks like it's because you're not allowing your body enough time off to be able to absorb what you need to. John, how do you measure like reaching a genetic potential? Like how would an athlete know when that's hmm. happening? Yeah, it's a, I kind of want to hear Hannah's thoughts on this one first, because it's really hard. There are no clear signs to say that you're at your genetic potential, but in Michael's case, there are a few things that are like signs to me that perhaps are not there. But Hannah, what do you think is someone that like, it's your job to reach your genetic potential. I feel like you might know more <laughs> about it than I would, <laughs> you know? Oh, uh, I think most people are not reaching their genetic potential. Um, and it's because in my opinion, it takes, it takes it being your job. And even then, sometimes it's hard to truly reach that. Um, and the reason I say that is because, you know, if you if you have anything else going on in your life that like we're talking about recovery, that's taking away from that ability to recover, there's still there's still room. There's still low hanging fruit. There's still things you can pick up. And even as a professional athlete, I almost feel like it's our job to believe that we haven't reached our genetic potential because it's our job to continually find those things that we can improve on, even when they are so marginal, more sleep, more food. I mean, those things are big, but when we're talking about an athlete who's already eating to the best of their abilities, quote unquote, clean eating, 
And an athlete's going and getting blood tests and learning, oh, well, if I, you know, just increase my protein intake this little bit, then I'll be better. It's really hard to reach that genetic potential. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people lean on that genetic potential pretty quickly because they reach a plateau and they think, well, gosh, I can't get any faster. There's nothing else I can do. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. and that might be true. There's nothing else (laughs) you can do in your life the way your life is. And that's okay because it's not your job. Um, But there are things, you know, if you didn't have family responsibilities, if you didn't have work responsibilities, you would probably be faster. But you can't quit your job. You can't tell your family, <laughs> hey, I'm not going to see you, for the, you know, like it, it, it's not practical. So and you're going to say like, profession- you can't kill your family. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you can't do that either. Just get that. rid of them. You don't do need them. Do that. Get rid of them. Dead weight. But, get them out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even as a professional athlete, we're bumping up against this all the time because life isn't perfect. Um, and as a professional athlete, the world does not stop for your training. You know, the amount of times that you're training through something like a family emergency is wild um, because you're trying Mm -hmm. to make all those gains. And for most people, that is impractical. And even for a professional athlete, you can't eliminate emotion. So if there's emotional stressors in your life, they're taking away. Again, you're not reaching that full potential. And so in some ways, personally, I think that we're all constantly um, pushing to reach it. And some of us are closer than others. But I don't know that anybody has the perfect life in order to be at it. Well, It'd be and really I feel interesting like- to talk to so, oh, sorry, Ivy, go ahead. No, it's okay. I just, I feel like Hannah, you're like a really good testament of an athlete that doesn't look at FTP as your barometer for hitting your potential. Like you focus so mm-hmm. much on like soft skills and technical skills and the other things that you can do to raise the level of what your potential is and could be. And it's not just in your FTP. Well, I think one of the reasons that happened for me is because I came into mountain biking as a triathlete. And so I had an FTP that was so much higher than my ability to use it. And so I would finish Mm -hmm. races looking around thinking my FTP is higher than everyone's here, but I was 10th. What gives? And that was such a frustrating feeling. And so I think exactly like you're saying, it's important to take a step back and also remember that When you're talking about, I want to keep getting faster, there are so many ways to keep getting faster that aren't just raising your FTP. In fact, there could be things that are holding you back from actually utilizing that FTP that you already have. Yeah, this is, um, there are two main signs, at least in Michael's case here, that show me that uh, we're probably not bumping up against genetic potential. Number one, you're mentioning the fact that it seems like this is give, this is taking a toll in terms of the things that you're sacrificing in your life. Like you're talking about early bedtimes and all these things, all of that. If you feel like it's stress, that's adding it in any form of stress. Your body isn't going to differentiate. It's all like oxidative stress. It's all difficult. And like your body isn't going to say, Oh, I can handle all of that because I'm not getting a lot of training stress right now or something. And I can take it in or you know, I'm very capable at absorbing training stress. So this life stress doesn't mean anything to me because the training stress is tougher. It doesn't work like that. If you have stress, it affects your body's ability Mm -hmm. to be able to adapt to things and tolerate things. So you have sources of stress. And I feel like it'd be really interesting to talk to somebody like, I don't know, like Usain Bolt or, uh, talk to somebody, I don't know, um, Sydney McLaughlin, like the, the hurdle star that we have, Mm -hmm. like these athletes that are just like really repetitive, like they are repeating incredible world record performances. And I would love to talk to them because I bet that their perspective isn't that they've hit their genetic potential. It's that they're finding ways to optimize their life, to be able to enable them to train and perform better. Mm -hmm. Uh, for, and 
uh, Ivy, you mentioned that like, you know, the genetic potential thing is a crutch. And I do think that practically speaking, we should be honest with ourselves. It's a very unproductive way to, to view our performance and our growth, uh, from the perspective of, oh, well, I'm just capped and that's just what it is. Instead, you can always view it from a growth perspective. And I think that that, uh, it's my belief that we're very far from our genetic potential. When I say we, I'm talking about us average folks here. We're far from our genetic potential, but we can be very practically limited. And our practical potential is, is the thing that is more relevant to us. Um, and from that perspective, why limit ourselves? Why like, uh, instead you should be looking at all ways to be able to enable yourself to do better. So in, in this case, you know, you're viewing the sacrifices of, you know, eating cleaner as you're stating, um, going to bed earlier, maybe missing out on those certain, certain things that you have. Which, Adding Michael, strength training. eat, eat a burrito, eat a cheeseburger. Like, you know, I, yeah. if it feels like that much, <laughs> I think there's maybe a misconception, like, you know, uh, that high level athletes, uh, don't mm -hmm. like eat greasy cheeseburgers sometimes. Like it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and like, and here's where don't things have get really like a, a late date night or something every once in a while. Yeah. Go ahead, Hannah. <laughs> when I feel like that's where things get really tricky. I'm glad you brought that up because I think being relaxed and being like calm and mm -hmm. having those joys in life also helps you perform. And so it's a really delicate balance because if you do feel like you're pushing yourself into this vacuum and you're unhappy because you're giving up all these things and now you have no friends and you never get to ride with anybody, like <laughs> that's probably hurting you even more. So it's really important mm -hmm. to still, you have to be extremely disciplined. Don't get me wrong. And as a professional athlete, I feel like discipline is the number, like one of the number one things in my life. But Sometimes you have to be disciplined enough to also understand I need to relax. Like that's a part of training as well. Um, and so mm -hmm. exactly like Ivy's saying, like if it's stressing you out to do these things perfectly, allow yourself one imperfection just to take that stress away. It will make you better. Yeah. There's, um, and again, what I'm trying to put into words, but doing a poor job of it's like what you guys are saying here. It's, um, there are sacrifices that an athlete makes when they train it's time away from it's opportunity cost, basically of things that they could be doing otherwise. Uh, if it gets to a point where you feel like those are causing more harm than good for your mental state and everything else, then you have to step back and reevaluate how you're approaching things or reevaluate what you're doing. And I think it's really healthy to maintain that balance of joy and satisfaction that you're getting from your life. Um, somebody's listened to this and they just like thrive and get all the joy and satisfaction out of getting like making more sacrifices. So everybody's very different and everybody's in a different spot on the spectrum with this. But I think that's really important. So, uh, looking at your TSS, <clears throat> you're around like 300 to 400 TSS. <clears throat> We're talking six week average rolling average here. So just from that alone, that's another sign that I'm looking at where I'm like, eh, I'm probably not at genetic potential, <laughs> right? Because like, yeah, I'm thinking of athletes like Hannah or, or, or Keegan or anybody else that we have on the podcast here. And these athletes that are putting in these high end performances and they're not at three to 400 TSS a week, they're accommodating more. And I think most average people can accommodate more than that. All of that said, I think the more notable thing that shows me that you're not at your genetic potential is just the fact that, you know, right now you're viewing things through this lens that you may be limited, uh, from your genetic side when really it's just practical limitations and you can alleviate those. But stepping back here, the most practical thing or the, the most important impactful thing that you can do negatively to your performance is to not take those recovery weeks. That's, you got to do better with that. And everybody listening to that, th listening to this, myself included, we should all look at our recovery weeks with a more diligent eye and more respect for the training prescriptions within them. If we do that, even though it feels like you're doing less, I promise you will get faster by doing less. Some uh, of my most successful so recovery weeks have been when I decided to go so far in the other direction and be like, oh, 45 minute easy spin, forget it. I'm tired, like not doing it. And just like <laughs> let myself yeah. like take a long nap and fully chill. Like I felt so good after those recovery weeks. Um, you're totally right though. I can't. Like you have to just. Yes. Go ahead. Hannah. 
I 100% agree. I just got excited. Sorry to interrupt. I just got excited because I completely (laughs) agree with you. And I think I cannot tell you how many times I've written a comment on my workout of like, well, dot, 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 I guess recovery does work, dot, 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 because it is so (laughs) frustrating. It's like you don't want to do it, but then when you do, you realize how much further you can dig. And the difficult thing about recovery is if you don't take it, you never see how much more ability you have. Um, You just think, well, this is what I can do and that's it. And you start failing workouts and you think, well, I'm not fit enough to do these workouts. And then you start training more and you start failing more and it just puts you in a downward spiral. Whereas really, if you rested, you would see oh my gosh, I've gotten so much stronger. You just haven't given yourself the ability to realize it, which is why for me, when I focus on rest, it's very difficult for me to focus on rest. But instead of thinking about the rest, I'm thinking about how hard I'm going to have to dig, how much deeper I'm going to have to dig because I'm taking that rest. Um, And that that ty- that satisfies that type A person in me because I realized that this rest It's not just rest. It's a signal to my body that the hard work is coming. Not only have we done it, but it is coming and it's time to prepare for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go into Darren's question. Last one. And if you are listening to this, you want to send in a question, you can do so at trainerroad.com slash podcast. If you're watching it on YouTube, give this a thumbs up and comment and share it with other people. All that tells YouTube that like, Hey, I should send this podcast to more cyclists, more people that find this. The more people that sign up for Trainer Road, the more great features we can build and the more podcasts we can bring you. So we appreciate you all. Thanks for doing it. Uh, Darren says, love the podcast and appreciate all you do. What are the podcast host's favorite pedal options for road and off-road? Do you use different pedals for gravel, cyclocross, and MTB, or are those all the same? What what cleat position do you prefer? Forward or back, far inside or outside? Any tips to help with setup from shoe to shoe? Finally, what can I do to avoid getting stuck in the pedal? I often ride in muddy conditions and haven't found a pedal that easily releases when the mud starts to dry out. For the cleat position thing, I feel like that's pretty individual and our suggestions should not drive your your suggestions if you're listening to this or like what you should do. Um, Maybe the forward and back thing, I guess we could talk about that a little bit. Let's get that out of the way and then we can talk about the pedals part. Are, are with mountain bikers, like downhill riders and such and enduro riders, they do, they put their cleat in, they slam it all the way back toward the heel and then they tighten it up. And that's like the common thing that you see with a lot of them. Their whole premise there is that what they're doing effectively is moving the foot like further forward. And when they move the foot further forward in relation to the pedal, then what that does is that allows like different weight distribution. And then that allows them to be able to corner better. That's the whole premise there. Then if you look at triathlon, like some people have the cleat, like underneath, like their arch, basically, like they get specific shoes to allow that. So I know there's a lot of different, like very polarizing opinions on this, but Hannah, are you uh, cleats forward, backward, or are you just finding the right spot that doesn't cause injury? <laughs> Pretty much just finding the right spot. But I, I I, think my biggest comment I would say on this is cleat position, once you get used to something and you know what works, like if my cleat is even a millimeter off, I will know. And I feel like the world is ending. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> once you find that right position, <laughs> it's really important to be able to transfer it from shoe to shoe. And one of the ways you can do that is by outlining the cleat with a Sharpie so that you can really match that position well. Um, Cause it, it is like cleat position is so important um, just for your own comfort level. And it can be really hard to get it perfect. So I'm actually curious, do either of you have a technique that you use to match it perfectly? Ivy, do you have one? Uh, no, because I feel like when I draw, um, the outline of where my cleat is and try to put it on another shoe, like I'm still, you know, kind of eyeballing it on the other shoe, on the new shoe Uh to see if Mm -hmm. it looks kind of close. And then, you know, Mm -hmm. many shoes like print like those like lines and grids. And I'm not 100% sure that those are uniform across Mm -hmm. like shoes Mm -hmm. E- not even in the same batch. Like I'm not a hundred percent sure that those are exact either. So honestly, I try my best and then go do some easy rides and 
if I have to adjust a little bit, I do. Um, and yeah, I, I'm y'all know not I've, able to do y'all it know perfectly. I've got a solution. Oh, I God, know. Like Here we go. Here, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jonathan's so, like, well, uh, I have a laser. It involves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, not far off. <laughs> um, so I have a piece of paper and I put it underneath my shoe and then I put the toe of my shoe against a wall. And I usually use like a 90 degree corner so then I can have like the shoe straight, right? So that it's like toe and then the outside of the shoe. Then what I do is I use a Sharpie and I just outline where the sole of my shoe is. So I have a point of reference and then I'll kind of like rock the shoe forward and I'll put a line where the back of the cleat is. Okay. Then what I do on my shoe with a Sharpie is I put my foot in my shoe and I actually like put a line on my sole where my ball, where the ball of my foot is or where the knuckle of your big toe is. And, and that's like the, I know that they have lines printed on the shoes to your point, Ivy. I don't, <clears throat> who's to say that line actually aligns with my foot. Maybe your toes are longer or shorter or something. And the ball of your foot's in a different spot. <clears throat> so I put my own Sharpie line on there. Then on the new shoe, I put a Sharpie line where the ball of my foot is. And then after that, what I can do is I have at least like a, a fore and aft point of reference to be able to do that. Then on the new shoe, I do a same outline thing on the piece of paper. And then I compare the two. Are they the same shape? Am I able to understand the like, and then with the midpoint of where the ball of my foot is, and then the outline of the shoe and where the cleat is, it's really easy to get it aligned exactly right. I know that there's tools out there. Somebody's probably like writing in that has a product for this. If you have it, let us know. Uh, if it's good, then you know maybe we can tell people about it. I don't know, um, but or you can leave comments in the YouTube channel all about your product that helps or the method that you have. But that's what I do. I use the paper. I outline the shoe. I mark where the cleat is, and then I do that for both shoes. And then I also mark with a sharpie where the ball of my foot is inside the shoe. And those two things help. I'm not a cleat all the way back person. I'm a cleat slightly toward back from center, but not all the way back. I'm also not an all the way inside or outside, but that absolutely depends on like the spindle size of your pedals and the width of your cranks. And if you have some weird setup, you should expect it to be different across your shoes because really the whole theory is that in relation to where your pelvis is, your feet should be falling in a specific spot and that part shouldn't be changing. So it makes sense to change the cleat position if you have different crank widths, lengths, or you know, mm -hmm. pedal spindle lengths or anything else like that across the board. Um, so yeah, that's how I manage that part. However, the other questions about pedals, uh, what do you use Hannah for pedals? I don't know if it's sponsored or, uh, what, what you have recommendations for pedals. Um, I use the Shimano XTR SPD pedals. Um, and I use that across Same. all of my bikes. Um, because again, I think that changing shoes and changing pedals, it does change your pedal stroke and your body position and all of that. So I like to have a very similar setup. I am curious to hear, uh, do you, do you, either of you switch to road pedals on the road? This is something I'm considering, mm -hmm. uh, for those marginal mm -hmm. gains. You do. Do you find a difference in power output at all? I do personally. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I don't notice a difference in power output for me, but I notice an absolute difference in terms of feeling locked in. Like mm -hmm. I'm much more locked in than I am on a mountain bike pedal. Um, at least that's the feeling that said I'm using, I use speed play zeros and I've used them for a long time and I want to try something different. Um, so I'm, I think I have a set of Dura Ace pedals that I could try, but I really want to try times. I think Ivy you use time. Is that I right? I use time no? for, uh, all off road. And then for the road, I use Shimano. Yeah. So I'm even like mixing yeah. brands, but I just feel mm -hmm. like for road having such a big platform of that cleat, like makes me feel like it's, there's a better transfer of power to the pedals for me. Mm -hmm. And that's just like, just a feeling and like from some very minor power observations, but that's just what I feel. Yeah. And I love the thing I love about the XTRs is that they're so darn durable Mm -hmm. I used Xpedo M Force 8 ties for a while. They're really light and they have an SPD style pedal to them. I've also used Crank Brothers and stuff and I I really didn't like the unpredictable nature of Crank Brothers like uh when you're in and then like you twist out, it's just like you keep twisting and then suddenly you're out. Whereas with like an SPD style pedal, you kind of bump up against a wall, then push past that wall and then you can get out. So there are many times using Crank Brothers where I was just like, oh, wow, my feet are off the pedals and I'm in the middle of the air just because oh. like <laughs> I went off the jump or something slightly like at an angle. So the feet were at an angle. And then, 
you know, it would just let go. So, um, and I know somebody's probably writing in that wants to defend those. And they said that I should have the little sleeves on the outside of the pedals because maybe the tread on my shoe wore down. And yes, I already had that in place and brand new <laughs> shoes too. So, um, <laughs> but there, uh, I like a really solid engagement, like something where I feel locked in. Um, but to the point here that we're seeing the problem with the M force eight, the X pedos that I had is that if they got muddy at all, I couldn't get out sometimes like, mm -hmm. and, and I mean, seriously, I, I actually had to take my foot out of my shoe more than a couple of times because just like when I was done riding, because it, it was in there and like, I had to absolutely like slam it with my hand to get the to get it out of there. Um, so you do have to look at that. And usually what ends up happening, if you're doing that, you have a cleat that isn't uh, that's a material that doesn't really play well with your pedal when any sort of grime, water, corrosion, anything else gets involved. And it's really easy for your cleats to get rusty. You should look at that. You should brush the rust off. You can use like a brass brush or something and just like some WD-40 or some oil and you can get them clean. You should service your cleats, like check them for being, uh, also if cleats are loose, it'll be really hard to get out because they will shift in relation to your shoe. So then when you try to get out, it'll like twist, but your cleats kind of stay in put. So you got to check your cleats. And if you don't, you know, you're, it's like a huge liability because it connects you directly to the bike. So, <clears throat> but I really want to try the time stuff. It seems like it could be a good option. The XTRs are just heavy. That's the only thing I, I dislike about them, but man, they're durable. I've slammed them against rocks and they're fine. And I went through so many XPDOs because they're hyper light, but also fragile. So for what it's worth in the topic of mud too, I've raced both, uh, SPD and time pedals in the mud and cyclocross. And I feel like mud clearance getting in and out in the time pedals is far superior. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, and that's like the key. And I know that's what crank brothers are like best at is like shedding mud and making it easy to get in and out of. So if you live in the UK and you're always racing cyclocross in the mud, it might be different for you. <clears throat> um, okay. Kim, I, I lied. There is one more question. So bonus question. Hopefully everybody's <laughs> excited for a bonus. Uh, Jessica's question says, I've been on a low volume plan for a while uh, now training for gravel races this summer. My A event is the hundred mile race at SBT gravel at the end of August. Unfortunately, work and life are really busy this spring, so I wasn't able to train as consistently as I wanted. My schedule is much more flexible from now until August, so I'm trying to figure out the best strategy for the next two months. In short, can I cram for SBT? My main goal at the event is just to enjoy the day, but I am competitive, so I'd also like to do the best I can. I live and train in Georgia at about 700 feet of elevation. <clears throat> Forgive me, I'm uh, it's not being sick. It's trying to keep up with juniors at, um, short track last night. And my voice is going away because Ooh. I absolutely destroyed myself trying to hold onto their wheels. So thanks kids and race organizers <laughs> for giving us a course with steep climbs where they can do like a thousand Watts repeatedly. Um, <clears throat> okay. They say I live and train in Georgia at about 700 feet of elevation. I'll have no altitude training going into SBT. So I know I'll have to dial it back up there or dial it back when I'm up there. On my current plan, I'm supposed to go into the rolling road race specialty phase soon, but I don't feel like I have the endurance or a base I'll need for SBT. So should I stick to the plan as is? Should I add endurance rides on the side or should I throw out the specialty phase and continue with more of a build phase? As a side note, I love, or I've, I've loved adaptive training with my erratic training. It still seems to give me a workout I can handle every time. I also love the podcast and am prepared for Ivy to call out my non-adherence. <laughs> Thanks in <laughs> advance. <laughs> Uh, Ivy, do you want to address it first? Then we'll go to you, Hannah, on this one. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it's okay to be non-adherent. You know, I'm not perfect either. <laughs> you had a crazy work-life balance and it's all of this is okay because you're adjusting your expectations appropriately, you know, and wondering like how you can accommodate or adjust for it now. So all of that's okay. Um, if you feel like you're in a place where you've been off the wagon for so long that you feel like just jumping into interval training right again or just jumping back into your plan doesn't feel like the right thing to do and you would rather ease into it, I tested this out in Plan Builder. And if you were to just start today, uh, Plan Builder is looking at your event and the timeline and the full scope of what you've been doing also to gauge your workouts appropriately. And it does give you a few weeks of base, a few weeks of build and lets you, um, rest after building and then gives you a really super short specialty phase 
just to kind of like tune you back up for the race on August 20th. So that's, that's what plan builder is made for. And I think that's what you should do. Um, and then of course, if you feel like you start getting into that endurance phase and you feel like you're picking up endurance a little bit more quickly than you thought you would, and you're ready to start mixing in some more challenging workouts, um, throw in a train now, you know, um, it's okay to mm -hmm. start like pressing it a little sooner than, than that plan accommodates if you, if you're ready and you, and you feel like you want to, but plan filter really is meant to address stuff like this. It's kind of cool. Cause I'm looking at Hannah's notes and like, uh, those suggestions that plan builder built out or that's how plan will do is exactly what Hannah said. She, uh, she would recommend also for training <laughs> Hannah. Yeah. Uh, what would you say in like, in terms of like maybe some additional guidelines, if you're quote cram training or panic training for something coming up like this, like what are some things they should look out <laughs> for or something they should try to avoid? Um, oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Cause I completely agree with what Ivy said and laid out. I think that's a perfect approach. I think, one thing that people do wrong when they cram train is um, the start and the end of it. So if you come in way too hot at the start, you're going to burn out. You're going to have a weird dip in the middle. And then <laughs> yeah, you're going to cram sure. again right before the race. And it just gets <laughs> bad yeah. all across the board. And so I think uh, uh, since you know you're cram training a little bit, start whatever you wherever you think you should start, start a little bit easier. Um, don't be tempted to fall into the, well, uh, you know, w whatever it might be, like trying to push the absolute limit. If you're pushing up against your limits at the start of that cramming, you have nowhere to go and nowhere to move. Um, so start a little further back and then don't be afraid or already now schedule out your time for taper and don't feel tempted to push into it. Like, well, if I just have a couple more days, then I can fit in this one last workout mm. that I need bad news. Um, yeah. so schedule that taper now and hold true to it because you probably will, you'll get to that point and you'll think, mm, maybe I can push it a little bit more, but planning it ahead mm -hmm. of time, know that what you know now, um, and what your plan is recommending is the best thing. So don't be tempted to override that when you get close to the race, get nervous and start making last minute decisions. It's so true, Hannah. And if there's any, the most important part of your training is the taper that should be respected with the most adherence. That's when you should be the most diligent. That's everything like that. That's what matters most because remember the cram training that you're doing <clears throat> or panic training that you're doing leading into this, it will have no effect. If you're just heavily laden with fatigue, it's going to have no effect. Like, like you're going to come in and you won't have a great performance. So you have to allow yourself to perform. So you're going to have to allow yourself to ease up. And that's panic training. What we do is we typically ignore recovery or we have a tendency to ignore recovery when we should be doing it. And we're always thinking, how can I do more? Because I'm shortchanged on the amount of days I have to train, but that's the wrong approach. You need to look at things from these are the circumstances and this is what they are. Who cares about what you couldn't do in the past and whatever the expectations were, you are where you are now. And you have a plan that you have to follow based on that. And the last thing that you want to do is try to fit in too much into that time frame because it's just going to make you fatigued. So it's really important to rest. That's the theme of this, this episode is respect rest. Like you have to respect your body and training is designed. Good training is designed to give you that sort of rest that you need. And even though you feel great, uh, it's just not the right time to, to be dosing yourself with extra stress. So that's my, my suggestion there. The, the other part with this too, you mentioned that like your goal is just to have a good day and, <clears throat> um, going into the race, especially when you're talking about going up in elevation from Georgia up to SBT, uh, I don't advocate just going off of RPE because if you train really well and you taper really well, you'll probably feel really fresh. You'll be unfamiliar with altitude. You'll show up and it'll be very easy to go too hard in the beginning. I really do advocate for getting a feel for what sort of like, you know, what your FTP is throughout this training and what's sustainable. And then on that day, reducing it based off of like what you should be doing for, um, at that sort of elevation, I think SPT is around 9,000 feet. Is that right? Uh, Hannah, it's quite high or is it lower eight or seven? Uh, I 
I can't remember. I'm not positive because I haven't done it. I think it's around eight. Yeah. Okay. So if it's around there, then you need to drop your FTP somewhere around like 15% uh, from whatever it is in Georgia. You need to drop it around just maybe a little less than 15% is what you need to drop when you go up there. So reduce your FTP by 15%. And then off of that reduced FTP, try to pace yourself to not break 70% of that. And then in the last, you know, 25 miles or whatever else, the last remaining quarter of the race, third of the race, you can let it all go and you can give it whatever you need. But that's really the best way to have a good day at altitude because your RPE is going to be like so inflated in the beginning, or I should say deflated. Like you're just going to be like, oh yeah, cool. I can ride at 500 Watts for the first little bit here. And like, there, no, he can't. And <laughs> especially up at elevation. So it's really important to put yourself in check. And that's just a great way to be able to manage and have a good day at the event, Jessica. So, uh, yeah, use plan builder. It's going to take care of things for you. Um, and then once you get into things and you have your taper in particular, but also throughout the whole experience, respect the rest. It's going to help a bunch. Thanks, Hannah and Ivy. Appreciate it. This has been a good episode. Awesome stuff. Thank you. Hannah, what's next for you? Uh, people, How can people f follow along and get in touch with you and support you? Yeah, I'm racing Soldier Hall this weekend. So UCI race pretty much in my backyard here in Utah. Um, and you can follow me at Hannah underscore Finchamp on Instagram, and I will take you along for the ride. Nice. And by the time people hear this, it, I guess Soho will have happened, but Ivy will also be there. So I hope oh lots of you got to meet gosh. Ivy as well. I was, I was I'm cosplaying, <laughs> Sorry, <Ivy. laughs> I'm cosplaying as a XC racer this weekend, <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually in the past. So nobody's going to come in with expectations because, you know, because yeah. of the recording schedule. So, um, yeah. And I was signed up for it, but because of getting sick, I reset my expectations, removed it had plan build or rebuild my plan and I'm continuing with training, uh, instead of driving out for the race. So, but, uh, looking forward to seeing everybody when you're listening to this, if you are listening to it right now and you're going to do the Truckee Tahoe, uh, gravel race, that's like a, there Haley Smith is out here doing it. We have Matt beers, Alex wild might do it. Uh, it's pretty cool. Lots in, in Setna, of course, and, and the whole crew I'll be there. I'll see you out there. Um, I'll be on the XC bike, just getting in a really properly hard day. Uh, and seeing what happens when the wheels come off. So then at single track six, if the wheels come off, it won't be too unfamiliar. <laughs> so yeah, that's the plan. I uh, hope to see you all there. If you're listening to this, once again, please rate and share the podcast. That's how you help. And go to Trainer Road and sign up. That's the best way. Um, a lot of podcasts that I listen to, like you can be a Patreon member for like $10 to $20 a month. And then like that supports them. Uh, we don't have Patreon. Instead, we have Trainer Road, which will actually make you faster than Patreon. So like, you know, if you want to support the podcast and get faster, it seems like a heck of a deal to me. So you should do it. Go sign up for Trainer Road. We'll talk to you all next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.